Right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to get to know you a bit better. So I'd like to ask who has seen this quote before? And I don't mean an hour ago when I was setting up. <laughs> One person. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, who of you has written some Java? Nice, all right. Who of you has written some Lisp? A lot of people, okay. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, so, uh, obviously, Guy Steele, a co-author of the Java spec, said, uh, you know, uh, for some criticism uh, of the Java language, he replied that uh, they wanted to convert the C++ programmers and they wanted to drag them a little bit of the way towards Lisp. Uh, now, what does Lisp do? Uh, Paul Graham, uh, is, uh, he's the founder of Y Combinator and a, and a Lisp programmer, uh, wrote out wrote up a list of features that make Lisp different. Now, Lisp is a very old language, and it has a lot of features that are slowly trickling into mainstream languages. Uh, so let's see what this is. The uh, the highlighted ones are the ones that were in C plus plus already. You know, conditionals, if statement, uh, recursion, the uh, you know, function calling itself. Uh, what Java added was uh, not too much. I, I don't think it's it's really halfway to Lisp, but at, at least a bit closer to Lisp. Uh, and uh, what Python added, of course, Python uh, was uh, made before Java, but uh, but got popular after it. So uh, Python took the Java programmers and dragged them even more to Lisp by adding stuff like uh, first class function, dynamic typing. Uh, so uh, there's still some way to go, and I'm not sure if we really want to go there and become Lisp, but maybe that's, that's in the future. Uh, anyway, uh, hello, I'm Peter Victorin. I work at Red Hat and uh, come from Brno, uh, and I'll be talking about the balance of Python. Uh, not really sure what the title means, but uh, bear with me. So this is a talk about language design. Uh, fair warning, it'll be uh, full of stereotypes about languages because I don't have time to go into the finer details of, of Java and Lisp. Uh, so if you know a bit more than shows here, uh, it's okay. You know more. Uh, this is this is you know a thirty-minute talk, so I have to skim over some details. Uh, anyway, uh, if I'm talking about Python language design, I cannot, I have to start with uh, the Zen of Python. How many of you have read this? Everyone who's paying attention, good. Uh, okay, so, so, so these, are, these are pretty much the, the, uh, the rules that, that Python language design is, is guided by. And when I look at them, I sometimes see uh, conflicts. I mean, special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, although practicality beats purity. So obviously there are some special cases which are special enough. Case in point, the super function, which doesn't work if we rename it. Uh, I mean, what do I do with this? In the, in the second half of the Zen of Python, there's uh, now is better than never, although never is often better than right now. I mean, uh, when is it a good time to add a feature to Python? This doesn't tell me anything. Are these guidelines any good? Well, they are. Uh, anytime uh, you have conflicting guidelines like that, it doesn't tell you that you know somebody was not thinking about the guidelines. It tells you that here's a point where you have to think even harder about the decisions you're making. So like all design, language design is about trade-offs, decisions, and uh, balancing competing forces uh, where, you, where you, know, you have to strike the right balance. And the, uh, the Zen of Python uh, summarizes a few of the major forces that, uh, that shape, shape the design. And sometimes they are competing, and it's up to the language designer to, uh, to find the right balance. Now, uh, of course, every programming language uh, does some decisions and compromises. 
everyone does them in different ways, which is what makes them all different and, and fun to talk about. Uh, so, for example, C code is close to the raw machine while still being portable across a lot of different kinds of machines. Uh, Java code is straightforward, even boring. Uh, well, all, not really boring. It's still interesting. <laughs> Manages to, to keep that balance. Maybe not where we would want it, but it has its, uh, its own design. Python code is uh, pretty hackable. Uh, while still being maintainable, while still you know, we can still use it in a large organization, it's uh, uh, it's pretty dynamic while still being fast enough to run the common case. Uh, and uh, now I'd, I'd like to look at different languages uh, based on what tools they they you know, like the basic tools they give you uh, to solve problems. You know. Uh, so in C, you get functions and structures and pointers, lots of really basic down-to-the-metal uh, tools that you can combine in different ways and build anything you want out of these. You get, uh, you get a lot of, uh, of control of the result, but you do have to have a pretty good knowledge of how, how these things combine together, and it's, it's not, not straightforward to combine them in meaningful ways. Uh, in Java, you have objects and methods and not really much else. So again, it's a, it's a pretty small set of tools. They're just on a higher level than C. Uh, like C++, that gives you functions, classes, and pointers, and references, and templates, and exceptions, and constructors, and destructors, and all those different things. And it's pretty confusing. Uh, but you know, the C++ programmers don't seem to mind, so it's, it's fine for them. Uh, and Lisp, on the other hand, again, uh, again, gives you a small set of, of tools. It gives you functions, macros, and not much else. Uh, but these tools are powerful enough. You can build anything on, on uh, you know, any of the above with these basic tools. So, so these are pretty general, and you can do anything you want. And you know these basic tools, of course, shape uh, the code that you write in the different languages. And in C, uh, not only ex explicit better than implicit, explicit is the only option you have. Uh, and well, it gives you a lot of control, but you have to build everything from scratch. Uh, in Java, uh, this is not a real acronym. Uh, did anybody hear about database normalization? The first normal form, second normal form, the stuff you learn at school, and uh, it's not really that practical in the real world. Well, uh, <laughs> Java reminds me of, of the object-oriented normal form. You have to uh, get a, look at the functionality you want and some, somehow shape it so that it conforms to the object-oriented model. And you know, sometimes it works. Uh, the, it certainly makes the code straightforward. That's why I call it the normal form. You know, there's only one way to do it, which which is pretty good, obviously. Uh, and what what happens there? Because you have you have a small set of tools, is people come up with the design patterns, which are uh, ways to solve a particular problem uh, that get re-implemented all the time, and everybody knows about them. Uh, so you know, to solve this problem, you have to uh, do this template code to solve that problem you have to do that template code uh, i'm not necessarily saying that bad, that's bad but you know python does it differently uh, in c plus plus you have so many different kinds of tools and uh, often you have several tools to solve the same problem and you have to pick one so what some programmers do there is they pick a subset of the language they say oh i'm not going to use raw pointers or I'm not going to use exceptions, and then C++ becomes a pleasant language to write in, but the problem is then you uh, try to use a library that doesn't uh, care about your decisions, and uh, you know, that's a problem. Uh, in Lisp, you have these really general tools, so what happens is to solve a problem in Lisp, you first write a language for solving that class of problems, and then you 
write a really simple script in that language to solve their problem. Uh, which, you know, it's, it's really powerful if, uh, if you have a team of wizards who can, uh, who can do this. I mean, this basically forces everyone to be a language designer. Uh, and language designer is pretty hard. So uh, it, yeah, it's 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 good for for uh, for uh, a team of of wizards. But uh, if you throw more people at the problem, it's, it kind of breaks down. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's that's that. Anyway, uh, so in Python, the situation is is a bit unique because you have all these different different. Uh, specific tools to uh, to address specific problems. You have iterators, you have callables, you have at the distinction between attribute and item access, like the getting something from an object is different than getting something from a dictionary for good reasons. And then you have classes as everywhere else. You have context managers for managing lifetimes of objects. You have generators, you have coroutines. So it's a, it's a rather large set of basic tools. Uh, unlike C++, there are no two tools that, uh, that solve the same problem. So, uh, so there is one obvious way to, to solve a problem. And as a programmer, you should look for that obvious way to solve the problem, which may not be obvious at first. But once you figure it out, it's, it's, uh, it's clear. Uh, so uh, the effect this has on the language is that you tend to use the right tool for the job. And just looking at the code, it's, it's uh, more obvious uh, to see what the code is doing. Right? If, you, if you just have named, named methods or if you just have macros, all code tends to look the same. But if you have, if you have different syntax for different things you want to do, uh, it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit more uh, much more easy to read more easy to differentiate uh, the different uh, different functionality in the code. Now, how did this functionality come to be in Python? Uh, when there is a uh, a construct uh, or a, a problem for for the large part for a large part of the community, when a lot of people see that something is impractical to do with the current language, uh, then uh, either a library comes up that solves the problem uh, in, a, in an easier way, or uh, if, if you can't do it with a library, new, a new syntax uh, is added to the language. Now, the discussions about adding new syntax are, are pretty involved. Uh, you know, it, people have to make sure that the new stuff works with uh, all uh, the the other things already in the language, and that it doesn't conflict with them. But uh, you know, once these discussions are over and everybody's happy with it, uh, we we get some new syntax. Uh, now, the important thing is about this is that uh, not only is it added for the built-in types in Python, but all the libraries are empowered to take advantage of the syntax. So you can. Uh, write custom classes that redefine or implement all of Python's operators. Uh, you can write custom context managers. You can write custom iterators. Uh, so Python gives you a lot of power to, to leverage this, uh, this special syntax, which is not, uh, not that common in, in all languages. I mean, certainly some have it, but, uh, but definitely not all. Uh, so how you do this, how you, how you extend, uh, extend your, uh, how, or how you teach your library to do this magic stuff, is usually you uh, implement a method with a pretty ugly name, right? But it's reasonably easy to do, but uh, uh, to use these powerful tools, there is something that, that kind of hints that this is getting into some layer of magic, and you should understand what you're doing a bit more than if you're just uh, just writing regular code. Uh, it's from from uh, great power comes great responsibility, as we've known for hundreds of years. And uh, these underscores serve as a warning that you know you're you're doing something special, and you should think a bit more 
about what it is you're doing. Uh, yeah, I'm running out of time, so uh, let's present this. Uh, so how this works, uh, simple is better than complex. So library authors have, uh, library authors should simplify complex things by identifying a common problem in, in code and writing, writing some layer that makes solving similar problems easier uh, for normal people who, uh, whose, whose code is, uh, is then simpler. Uh, now, when you're writing a library, uh, you have to keep in mind much more than when you're just using it. You have to not only know of all the tools you can use, you should also think about the concepts uh, quite a bit more. Of course, you, you should think about these all the time, but you need to be really, uh, be really mindful if you're solving a broad set of problems than if you're just, uh, just solving one. Uh, this gives us a uh, pyramid or a ladder of, of use cases. Uh, okay, so uh, at the base of the pyramid, we have some general users. Uh, these are the people writing, you know, a, a Flask application or blinking LEDs on your micro bits or uh, doing some numerical calculations on num uh, with NumPy. Uh, and this should be pretty much everybody. This should be taught in elementary schools. Everybody should do this. You shouldn't know a lot about the language, about the power it gives you to be able to write simple things. Uh, now, when these users have a problem uh, they can't solve, they go one level up to the library authors and, and uh, the library authors solve the problem for them. The library authors are the ones who should know how to write a class and how inheritance works, right? Uh, so uh, these people know a, a bit more about the kinds of problems that people are solving and provide the tools uh, to, sol uh, to solve those problems simply. Now, when the library authors have a problem, uh, they go one le level up uh, to some kind of ecosystem leaders. These are the people who write the library like NumPy and des decide how, how indexing works in multidimensional arrays or people writing the Flask library and deciding, oh, this is, this is a good place to use a decorator. Uh, and these people not only make the tools, but they also make guidelines for how to, how to use the tools and how to express certain ideas in the language. And you know, this, this goes for, uh, for all, the, all the levels. Like library authors also uh, write documentation, so they uh, decide how code in that library will look. Of course, when the ecosystem leaders have a problem with the language, they can't express something, they go to the language designers and there are discussions involving all of Python users uh, and hopefully their problem is solved. Now, uh, of course, this is not about people. This is more about the roles that people fill. So uh, you should always be mindful of the level that you're currently at. If you're writing a library, uh, you can use magic stuff like classes and meta classes. But then if you're writing documentation for that library, it should be at uh, one level down, right? If I'm telling my user to use a meta class in my library, I'm probably doing something wrong. Uh, so what this comes down to is, uh, is readability, right? Uh, to be at the lower level, you, uh, the code needs to be much more readable, much more accessible to, uh, to more people. Uh, of course, readability counts as one of the lines in the Zen of Python. Uh, an extended quote is reader program must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute because uh, all code we wrote, uh, all code we read, especially if it's in library, is, is telling not only the computer but also the, uh, the people about what it's doing. And then if you want to write maintainable code, you have to write code that people understand. And you would want as many people as you can to understand that code. You know, that's why you want wanted, uh, everything to be as simple as possible. Uh, so what is readability? Uh, here's a Wikipedia definition. I'll give you some time to read it. So it's the ease of uh, with which a reader can understand a written text. Uh, now, Wikipedia also has another definition specifically for code. This is for written text. 
but there's a lot of a uh, lot of things even in this definition for basically english uh, that that applies to python right so the readability of text depends on its content on the complexity of its vocabulary and syntax and also on presentation like uh, typographics aspects uh, that's a uh, when you read a book and it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a uh, mathematical uh, handbook with lots of uh, lots of hard words and you can't understand half of it it's not very readable on the other hand when you re read a children's book you know everybody can understand it it's kind of kind of boring to read it but everybody can understand it uh, and also the presentations does a lot to readability uh, that's why uh, mathematicians write in latex which is known for you know good typographical uh, uh, typographical treatment of the text. Uh, so stuff like font size and where you put a space, uh, all that all that matters in, in how easy it is for us to process the information. Now in the context of Python, uh, the complexity of vocabulary uh, doesn't doesn't uh, isn't uh, only concerned about the uh, the actual length of words or of idioms that we use, but also about familiarity, right? The more you see a particular way of expressing a problem or a particular word, uh, the more familiar with it and the more easy it becomes to process it. Uh, take a word like through, which is not really easy to spell, but because everybody sees it all the time, it, it becomes second nature to us to just, to just write it. Uh, and even if if we have trouble with writing it, we can we can read it just fine, right? Uh, so through is one of the one hundred most common words in English used in this great book that only uses those simple words. Uh, and this book basically equates uh, uh, simplicity of vocabulary with how often that word is used, right? So uh, once something is is common enough it becomes easy for us to process. Uh, now, the other part about readability was the typographical stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, so, in English, there are rules like you should base, put a space after comma, you should separate paragraphs so that they're distinct from each other, and so on. In Python, we have F8, which tells us, you know, you should uh, put a space after a comma, you should separate top-level functions with a certain number of blank lines. You should use uh, lowercase with uh, underscores uh, for everything that's not a class and capitals for a class. You should limit your lines to uh, some ideal length. Uh, you should not have very long lines that you that you then break up into uh, into several. Uh, several uh, physical lines and so on and really there's a lot of uh, lot of parallels between written text like written language and how python is supposed to look and the reason this is uh, done this way is because it helps readability it helps you process the information uh, more quickly and effectively uh, and of course pep8 is not a hard rule it's it's not built into the syntax it's uh, something that's enforced by conventions, by, by the community deciding, okay, we're just going to do this. And because everybody is now going to do this, this will become the obvious way to do it. And uh, everybody will use it. It'll become familiar and then it'll become easier to read. I'll skip here. Uh, so this, uh, this gives rise to something we call Python idioms. Uh, these are both pretty incomprehensible when you first see them, but once you think a bit more about them, you learn uh, how it works, and then it becomes second nature pretty much. Uh, so it's it's better if the whole community uh, decides on one of the idioms, then everybody uses it, and if you use the other one, someone will tell you, ah, this is not the way we do it in Python, do it the other way, and that makes the other way more common, and even if it wasn't simpler and, and uh, 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 less characters to read, it would be more 
uh, readable just because everybody else is using it. So that's uh, something conventions do due to the language, something that's not baked in, but something the community provides. Uh, uh, a phrase that's repeated often is that the old Python users are consenting adults. Uh, you can do uh, pretty much anything with Python. You can monkey patch stuff, you can make a uh, number-like class do weird stuff when you divide by it, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, but uh, watch yourself in public. <laughs> now, if, if you send something like that to code review, uh, you're probably not going to get that pull request in because everybody knows that's not how we do stuff. You should, you should make your code re more readable. And it's not, uh, not a property of the language itself. It's, it's just our mindset. It's just the shared knowledge of what readable code looks like. It's, it's like in that book. I mean, you can, read, uh, you can read any piece of text, but there are some conventions like ty typographical stuff and, and uh, structural uh, conventions that made it, make it more readable. And it's not, uh, it's not that much about rules of the language, but, uh, but uh, d uh, shared decisions about how it should be formatted. Hey, uh, anyway, uh, this is what I wanted to end with. Python managed to drag Java programmers another halfway to Lisp, if you've seen that beginning. Uh, but the concept of Pythonic code managed to drag them halfway back to uh, static typing, straightforward, boring code, which, make, which is wonderful for maintainability and readability of the code. But you can still uh, explore the language and you can make experiments, you can, you can innovate and do all the weird stuff. Uh, just don't put it in a widely used library. Hey, uh, that's it for me. Thanks for listening.